inspire You know, I wasn't really going to come to this reunion. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, well, what am I going to do? I get dinner, I got all the food, you know, I get parties, what am I going to do? But the invitation was far. It clearly wasn't for my academic achievements, um, <laughs> or professional achievements, like the other students. Could it be a little louder, just a little bit? Yes. The, uh, the reason for them inviting me clearly wasn't for my academic achievements. And uh, in fact, the other speakers really haven't left me much to speak about. My friendship won't be nearly as nice as towards me. Um, <laughs> Peter's already talked about it, I said, or, you know, unmindful decisions that lead to irrational decisions. Um, Danny already talked about relaxation and conversion. <laughs> so it's like, and, uh, well, Roger just gave me a nice synopsis, so... <laughs> well, you know, you, you probably wouldn't have expected me to do something traditional. <laughs> uh, when, I mean, even when I was, when I was at Carleton, uh, there were times where I would dress unconventionally, but that quality never really came to fruition until after graduation. <laughs> so learning to, to walk around and dress like this in public is a whole, you know, training in itself. Uh, just watching the action and uh, how I intentionally set myself apart uh, from mainstream society. And that's a very, you know, it's a very powerful reflection just in and of itself. Uh, and I remember the first time that I came back and was walking around Berkeley in San Francisco dressed like this and I had only been a month short time. Uh, but I came back to visit because my grandfather was sick. And um, I'm just asking myself, you know, hey, why are these people looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> you got a problem? What? <laughs> no, I'm just asking myself, oh, yeah, okay, if I'm intentionally dressed unconventionally, Initially, a sense of self-consciousness arose, and then I uh, started to reflect. Well, you know, this is a symbol. This is a symbol of, of uh, the Buddhist enlightenment. This is a symbol of, of awakening, of truth. And there's nothing to be embarrassed about. And then uh, I started to walk you know, a bit more like this is my my freedom flag. <laughs> <laughs> so I I learned to wear it. And for many years now, I just don't, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the, uh, that genre of uh, action movies that portray, portray Buddhist monks as kung fu masters. <laughs> <laughs> that really helps with the self Roger Jackson 
as well as Bardwell Smith, did have a very important and profound uh, influence on him, a very positive influence. And uh, really, uh, you know, the, the senior year mistresses in class, <laughs> that was it, the seeds were planted. <laughs> and also it helped that we had a Japanese Zen master come down from Minneapolis in my senior year who actually taught meditation, taught a course when I was getting credit for. <laughs> Only a copy. And, <laughs> and uh, so after graduation, I was living in Minneapolis, was going regularly to the Zen Center to learn how to practice meditation. Uh, while I was in Carleton, I was interested in Buddhism. Uh, however, well, I mean, some of you might remember that I wasn't acting very monk like. <laughs> So the, the seeds were, were definitely below the surface at that point. But after graduation, uh, this retreat, monastic retreat, came up for two months in the fall after graduation. And I didn't have anything really that I was committed to. Uh, so I said, well, why don't I uh, just join it? And so I showed up at this retreat center ready for this really intensive Japanese uh, two-month retreat, just like they do in Japan, very intense from early in the morning to late at night, hardly any sleep. And uh, they're all dressed in robes, bald head, and I show up with long curly hair and uh, guitar and, and uh, <laughs> drumsticks in my back pocket. <laughs> Look at him and say, these fields are great, man, where's the frisbee? <laughs> and they kind of looked at me and said, well, how long? I wonder how long he's going to last. <laughs> Well, what surprised everyone, including me, was that I really took to it and liked it. And by the end of that two months, um, I said, yeah, someday, maybe I'll be a monk. When I retire. I'm <laughs> 65. When I've done everything else. And um, because that, that retreat, you know, that, that first one was, was very intense. Because when you do intensive meditation, it's not like you're just sitting there peaceful all the time happy and blissful. What, what it does is kind of bring up all the old karma that we've been making, certainly in this lifetime, which was a lot. And I felt like I relived my entire life. You know, there were occasionally moments where I was in the present moment, um, but most of the time it was like reliving all this stuff and working through it. And, you know, some of the karma that we made just in ordinary life. Um, it's kind of painful to, to, to live through. So by the end of that, uh, I continued on for the next uh, couple of years, mainly getting life experience traveling, you know, traveling the United States. But every year I'd come back and do another two months at this place. And by the end of the second one, I figured, I can't wait till I'm retired. Maybe about 35 or so. <laughs> then I went off traveling again. Came back to the third one. By the end of the third one, I thought I'd better start looking for a monastery now. Mm -hmm. Because the other things that I thought were, that I wanted to do, that I loved doing, somehow they just were, were seeming less important. And that was just as surprising to me as everyone else. I certainly had never envisioned myself as being a monk. But somehow things were going in that direction. And just, I guess it was the um, both my experience already, which had been very positive in, in the benefits that come from that type of meditation. And also just the, the promise of <coughs> leading a life that's devoted to wisdom, leading a life that, that really seems, um, you know, leading to real freedom. And I thought, well, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? There wasn't such a big draw to material life. I mean, even if I wasn't a monk, I probably wouldn't be that interested in the material comforts of money. But, but really, what I really valued was wisdom. And that's what I really um, respected. And so I thought, well, if I just die a wise old man, that would be good enough. So I, I hope I don't die for another few decades. <laughs> what a work to do. <laughs> so 
So this was me at the, at the uh, Zen, intensive Zen retreat. Very typical Zen one. There <laughs> um, we go. <laughs>
kind of month there that I probably mentioned in India, I went back to Thailand. And at that point, I was 25. I found a monastery that had some Western monks in it. And I heard of other places that were set up just for Westerners, traditional places, but teaching within English. And so I decided, yeah, that's really what I want to do. And once I made that decision, then I went home, spent time with my parent, family, my parents, my grandparents. Um, I really wanted them to understand as, as much as possible what was going on. Unfortunately, uh, you know, they all said, to a life. <laughs> and, and in the end, they become very, very supportive and uh, I would say proud. The, uh, it was fun going back and actually giving away all my stuff, what, you know, whatever I could, I would just give away. And the last thing to go was my drum set. <laughs> that was, the, the attachment ran very deep. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is it, this is the last thing. And uh, the money that I got from selling that then allowed me to get back to Asia and go to a monastery in the northeast of Thailand. So here we have Thailand, and where I ordained was in this area, where in Chala, right there. And as you can see, it looks very close to Cambodia and Laos. It's a very rural part of the country, very traditional monastic training. And fortunately, one of the great Buddhist meditation masters, Ajahn Chah, was still alive at that time. And uh, I was just very impressed with the caliber of the other monks in the monastery. And I uh, thought, this is great. This is the best I've done. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, the early days. Uh, was, the hair is getting shorter. <laughs> and it's a gradual process. Mm -hmm. you know, you, uh, things are very simple. You give them little huts. This was my ordination in white robes. You were named first in white robes for three to six months. And this is my ordination as a monk. Full ordination. <laughs> this is a symbolized uh, the Buddha cutting off his hair with a, with a sword. Jim, when was your uh, your monk ordination? What year was that? Uh, 1990. I ordained, ordained as a novice in 1989. In 1990, I had full ordination. And so a typical day at the monastery would begin with uh, the wake up bell going at 3 a.m. And, you know, that's used to be when I go to bed. <laughs> <laughs>
silently. The whole thing was done in silence. Very, very calm. And we weren't looking around. We just to keep, keep our whole composure very restrained and calm. So that, that was a beautiful way to start the day. And it was good for, for everyone involved. Even uh, you know, the, the people doing that. Thailand is known as a really happy country, a land of smiles, and I think one of the reasons is so many people start the day with generosity. You know, just something so simple, but just starting every day by, by giving something. And generally, you, you do get more happiness from giving than from receiving. So, you know, we were, you know, in many ways, we felt like we were giving the opportunity for these people uh, to do this. Uh, because we didn't really need to. Enough people would bring food to the monastery. What kind of food? What was your diet? Uh, sticky rice. Have you ever had sticky rice? It's a really compact, um, stick to your guts kind of rice. Um, and just a lot of curries, vegetables, a lot of fruit. So it was a relatively healthy diet. So this is going on and on. There's the monastery sign. Wat Manarachat means the International Forest Monastery. There was the main monastery of our teacher, Ajahn Chah, was seven kilometers away, a couple of miles away. And he was getting so many Western disciples. So then about 30 years ago, they opened up a monastery specifically for non thais so All the training was just the same, very traditional, but all the teaching was in English. So that made it so easy for those of us coming from overseas to really plug in quickly to this. Have you learned any Thai since then? Yes, that was one of the things that I was determined to do was to be able to learn Thai so that I could um, hear the teachings from the various masters without any interpretation. And so yeah, I, I did learn to be fluent in Thai and um, in the end end up doing translations of my own. Typical scene in rural Thailand. And as we get closer to the village, they'll usually have little children as, as uh, kind of spotters. <laughs> All the young ones there. And as we start to get close, the kids go, the monks are coming, the monks are coming. <laughs> and then the, the people come out of their houses. So then we'd always share 
<laughs> with all beings. This is one of our buildings, one of our meditation halls. We typically meet in there for teachings. And then when it was time for the meal to come out, all the food would be formally offered, sit down. We chant a blessing before the meal. Now, one of the great things about eating out of a fruit bowl is that you only have one dish to wash. Right? It really simplifies life. And that a lot of what we do in our lifestyle is just about simplification. So it's not ascetic in that sense. It's just moving towards simplification. And in the process of moving towards simplification, you have to give up sometimes uh, a bit of the comfort level. After the meal's chores time, keeping the path swept, everything becomes meditation. And when we go back to our hut, this is a typical hut that we live in. It's raised up um, partly because there's a lot of dangerous animals crawling around the ground, snakes being one of the main ones. This is also a typical hut, a traditional bamboo grass roof hut. And then the huts are set up so that we have plenty of time for meditation. Go back to your hut. Uh, we've got a lot of time before the next meeting. Now to sit meditation. Do walking meditation as well. Now, meditation is essentially about developing a continuity of awareness. Something very simple. Whether you're focusing on your breath, whether you're focusing on uh, a word that you're repeating internally, whether you're focusing on a particular theme or quality, it's just a matter of that continuity of awareness which gives it uh, power. And it has a, a power to transform. Very simple. But it, with doing it repeatedly is what gives it the power. Jim? Why do you have to sit like that? <laughs> Why do you have to sit like that? It just looks more impressive. <laughs> What is that surface? 
that's just dirt, just from uh, just from walking back and forth. It's uh, become quite packed. So even the simple act of walking back and forth can become really pleasurable. Women's section in the monastery. I've got my my uh, razor, you know, in my place. If anyone wants to have a So are women and men sort of parallel there, or is there mingling at all? Separate in the monastery, they keep the, the, the men's section and the women's section pretty separate. Although for teachings, especially in our monastery, the Western monastery, this far more integration in equality or equality than it would be in a typical time monster. Is the training the same for men and women? So yes and no. Internally, yes. In terms of techniques, uh, the whole point of it, the purpose. Uh, in terms of high society, no. Thai society is very hierarchical society. Uh, you know, women and men have very clear gender roles in Thailand, uh, which is very, it's a very different culture than ours. And so in Thailand, you only have so much flexibility. And of course, it's changing radically with the modern age, but, but it's still light years away from what we would consider uh, parity in terms of gender roles. Has to do with that blood flow that Daniel was talking about. <laughs> uh, we learned how to, how to sew our robes and make almost everything that we have, which is a nice feeling. And, you know, and usually the first robes don't turn out very nice. <laughs> <laughs> but we get practice and we become quite good at it. So there are different robes. I mean, we've seen sort of short sleeved, we've got a long covered sleeve. Given how warm it's been, I wonder if you wish you had the short sleeve. Can you talk? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we recognize that person. But the other arm was the one that your left arm, in some of your pictures, was almost was open. Like, yeah. Right. No, not your right. Your left was also. Uh -huh. um, in in the monastery, for formal occasions, we'll have one shoulder open. Outside the monastery, we'll have both shoulders covered with this robe. Within the monastery, for non-formal occasions, like sewing, then we don't have to wear this robe at all. And we just have a very light robe on the beneath. This time is very hot. It looks Almost like you've got a lot of extra fabric that you have rolled up under your arm. This? Yes. Uh, I can demonstrate. So the, uh, the robe, the big one, it's just a big rectangle, yeah. and uh, it has a very specific pattern, same pattern that was uh, used in the time of the Buddha with the borders, uh, sewing lines uh, horizontally and vertically, and we make it uh, an appropriate size for our height and uh, girth. <laughs> So, informally, we're just dressed like this. And then, uh, put it on. Please don't try this on Halloween. <laughs> 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 we, have, we have a certain social standard that we try to <laughs> we might, we kind of represent Buddhism in the world as well. But, uh, Anyways, it takes about 10 years to learn how to do this properly. So you roll it up like a big tube. When it's over both shoulders, then you roll from the inside, continuing this. So the first time you did this, how long did it take? 
question is, how long did it take for it to fall off? <laughs> Given what you just said, this may not 
happen, but you see with time and with practice the idiosyncrasies going away. And the second, could you talk a little bit about past lives? What what was the first one going away? Do you, do you see the you know you talk about everybody has their idiosyncrasies? Oh, I guess. And I imagine that's connected with ego. Right. Do those kind of fade? The self gets out of the way. What makes uh, we don't lose our personality because that's very deeply ingrained. Even fully enlightened people will have a specific personality. Some are more charismatic, some are more very quiet, some are good teachers, some hardly say anything. But the important thing is the level of, say, the level of anger, the level of um, negative forms of desire. The level of delusion based around self-centered, self-centered perceptions of how we live in the world. Uh, these are things which really cause us unhappiness in a direct way. And the whole practice is designed to gradually uproot those. So then it's more like we, the bad moods gradually reduce, leaving just sort of the nice stuff. <laughs> past lives. Well, I have no uh, direct experience or recollection of past lives personally. And it, in Buddhism, it, there's no, um, you don't have to believe anything before you can start practicing. You know, there's, there's no dogma in that sense. It's not, a, uh, it's not that certain beliefs are going to start you off or, or determine whether you're a Buddhist or not. But it's really just starting off and, and taking these teachings and see if they work. There are certain teachings which it may be very difficult to verify, like, like teachings on past lives. So there, it's fine to take certain things like that and put them in the I don't know basket. Because there are so many very practical things that we know are good and are obvious. And, you know, that, that are not dependent necessarily on knowing whether or not um, rebirth occurs or how it occurs. Now, personally, over the period of time that I was in Thailand, through my contact with various meditation masters who, uh, who I trusted completely, I'd speak to them in private and say, you know, is this meditative uh, rebirth stuff? Is this true? You know, are there, is it really true about you know, unseen beings, the other realms? Yeah, and they would just, you know, without any hesitation, say, yeah. And many of them could actually remember past lives very clearly. So that, uh, that increased my sense of belief in it. But even with the belief, if you haven't experienced something directly, then it's good to always just to, you know, just take it as a, well, it's still a hypothesis. You don't really know for sure. Yeah. Um, now that you're in a role as an abbot, um, how is, how, what is the flow of your daily life now and what are your responsibilities and, and, and how is it different than the, the first portion of your time as a monk? Okay, well I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, in the early years as a monk, we don't have a whole lot of responsibilities except to learn monkish things. <laughs> about where you wrote properly. I mean, the first time I went off on Maltron, I wasn't joking when I said I was falling off. The day after ordination of my novice ordination, going through Maltron in the village, carrying the ball, and then you have to run up and get the senior monk's ball. And by the time I did that, and my robes dragging on the ground, <laughs> falling off the shoulder, it does take a while just to learn the basics of that. And you give them a lot of time just to meditate. And, and do the do the basic work, both internal work and, and as well as external work, and without any real expectations of responsibilities for the first five, usually for the first ten years. So there's uh, the robe which has been sewn from white cotton, sewn all together, and then we take a natural dye to get this color. This is the hardwood from a jackfruit tree. It's for yellow wood, and then we use machetes to chop it up into chips, very labor intensive. And we put it into a big wok, 
when she's on top of the stove. And we boil it up. And this is usually a process that takes at least 24 hours boiling. And then we get this nice, beautiful dye that comes out. And uh, massage the dye into the white cloth. And then we get this beautiful rose. Mm -hmm. In the evening, then, we would often meet again for Dhamma teachings. Dhamma is the word which means the teachings of the Buddha. Um, it actually means nature. You can, you can define it in different ways. Uh, originally, it just meant nature. Or the laws in accordance with nature. Or the teachings, then, which lead one to live in harmony with the laws of nature. And even before the Buddha came along, that word was used. And so uh, every different teacher would have their Dhamma. And when the Buddha came along, that was the Buddha's Dhamma, the Buddha Dhamma. And at the end of the day, again, coming down. That's Ajahn Chah. Now, our monastery, before it was a monastery, was a cremation mound. And that was one reason why there was still good forest there, because all the local villagers know that it's haunted. <laughs> so they wouldn't go in there and cut the trees down. And then a couple of our Western monks from about 30 years ago came and started staying in that forest. And from that uh, began the monastery. But it's still a cremation ground. And this is the, the crematorium, which is still right in the center of it. So periodically, regularly, uh, we still have cremations. Villagers will bring the casket in, collect wood. Everything's very open. And so it's very powerful. You know, once or twice a month, you, you, you're there watching what happens to a human body after the life force departs. And the next day, what's that? Do you play an active role in events such as birth, death, and marriage? Definitely in death. Um, the monks are very much part of the ceremony with, uh, with chanting, um, yeah, many of those. Um, with birth, not so much directly with birth, but maybe soon after birth, they'll, they'll bring babies. Uh, if they're just for a bit of a good luck. And not so much with marriage. We don't encourage marriage. Not only on young men came to be a monk before they went out and got married? Is that, yeah. So is that still the case? Or when someone commits to that path, that's ideally the lifetime? Well, most people in Thailand, say 50, 100 years ago, had a lot more time. And they could just take a whole season off or a whole year off uh, without really interrupting their family life, the life on the farm. And they could just live in the monastery during that time. But these days, it's very difficult. Modern life has come in, and maybe they've got two weeks of vacation a year, so they'll still maybe come and do that two weeks uh, of their vacation, but it's, you know, it's not the same. You can only go uh, so deep in two weeks. But they're expected to do that, and I mean, are they, what are they taking away from that experience in your, from, your, from your experience with that? Because a lot of young males are expected to do. Yeah, it's still good, it's just that it's very brief. Um, also, it very much depends on the monastery they go to. Some of the monasteries are really good practicing monasteries, and, and it's like doing a meditation retreat for two weeks, which can be very transformative uh, and inspiring. And they really take that experience and keep it with them throughout their life. Other monasteries are not so inspiring, and they just ordain you, and then you're on your own, and don't really have much guidance or see the point of it. Is there any age restriction for how young kids can go into the monastery? Yeah, seven years old. No younger than seven. Mm -hmm. But you will see a lot of uh, young kids in Thailand. Mm -hmm. 
So this is uh, our teacher, Ajahn Chah. So his monastery is just um, within walking distance of ours. He passed away in 1993, no, sorry, 1992, and they kept his body for a year, and then had a cremation one year later, 1993. This was the spot where they cremated him and then built this monument here. But his funeral was a big event. There was like 10,000 monks and nuns, and then hundreds of thousands of lay people coming. Just within Thailand, there are 300 branch monasteries. More than 300 branch monasteries. And overseas, there's about 15. So well, this, this is a, a scene from the funeral. <coughs> now we have two branch monasteries of that main monastery. And one is right on the border with Laos. So that's the Mekong River, that's Laos on the other side. And these are big cliffs that go right down. And if I spend a lot of time in this monastery, this was a hut that uh, I helped build and lived there for quite a while. This was one of the caves in the area. Making tea in the afternoon. This was a cave I lived at for about six months. <coughs> That's the title of the talk. <laughs> Another cave, monastery. And we also have a branch monastery on the border of Burma. And a very <coughs> thick, pristine jungle. To get out there, typically the whole community would walk in, taking about four days. And we're going through the jungle, so it's real, you know, it's a real track. But there's a real sense of camaraderie that develops in doing that. Jim? Where are we? Sorry. Uh, is, is there a connection, or do you communicate with the monks in Burma? I mean, is there a, uh, is, is there a cross? That's a, no, it's, well, we're right on the Burma, border with Burma, but that's a wild area. I mean, that's, uh, that's not under government control. It's under minority control. And just beyond the edge of our monastery, uh, the local people have, have said, you know, they were like, just don't go in there because it's all mined. Uh, I mean, we, there's active resistance happening very close by. So no, we don't go that direction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the fun thing about being in the jungle. You get a lot of challenges. Did you ever talk about things unrelated to your practice? Or was Focus on why you were there. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, maybe not so much about, you know, comparing Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. You <laughs> 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 might talk a bit about, you, know, you, you get to know each other as friends. Mm -hmm. You talk about past, you talk about aspirations, a family. It's just like develop friendships with people. So this is what a, a lot of Thailand went through. It's just slash and burn. Mm -hmm. And the walk-in, we'd, we'd walk through places that were like this, just freshly logged illegally and burned. And then we'd get into our monastery, and it's like this. Gives you an idea of what Thailand used to be like. Just water, everywhere, marsh. A lot of wildlife. Do you have well, malaria? Have you had malaria? <laughs> Fortunately, I have, I'm not superstitious, but <laughs> <laughs> fortunately, I have not had malaria. Although a lot 
of my friends have in hand. Yeah, it, staying out here uh, was, you had about 50-50 chance of getting it. Mm. It was that high. Mm. What sort of medical care do you have access to when you're there? If you did get malaria, how would you be treated? Um, you would be put on the back of a pickup truck, which would then carry you through really rough roads uh, for half a day to take you to a hospital. <laughs> but we did have, right on site, we did have some cleaning, uh, you know, basic things, and we were all trained in basic uh, medical care, first, basic first aid. So there's a bigger snake, which is <laughs> around as well. Big pythons. They're really cute. <laughs> they just want to be loved like the rest of them. <laughs> uh, lots of streams, so we make these bamboo bridges, and we live on these little bamboo platforms with a mosquito net. This is the place that I lived in one year. Still some big trees around. This was our meditation hall. To clean the floor, we'd uh, cut coconut, and coconuts in half, and then just scrub the floor with it. It worked very well. So at night, night time is where it gets really fun because most of the animals are nocturnal. <laughs> and we'd be spaced quite far away from each other in the jungle. Uh, so you usually couldn't see the other people very clearly if you're really alone. Uh, but you had a mosquito net to protect you. <laughs> yeah. Psychologically, it's one of those things psychologically. You know, it feels really safe inside your mosquito net. Rationally, you know, it's not really going to stop the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> so we set up a camera on, uh, on the path that we used during the day. And it had a, a laser trip. And there were some, some people who came with us. And these are some of the things they saw. This was a, a wild boar. And they're actually it's very large. Wild boars are considered more dangerous than tigers because they're more aggressive. And then, of course, <laughs> the same paths that we're using during the day, the tigers are using at night. <laughs> but normally we don't hear them. <laughs> but the power of loving kindness. <laughs> No, this, no, that is, that's not a stuffed tiger. That's a real tiger, but it's a tame tiger. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really count. <laughs> Are they living in captivity? They're living in a monastery that, uh, yeah, yeah, practice, uh, Buddhist practice for all of you. <laughs> choice of celibacy. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they do live in a monastery, and the monastery started off with just one tiger that had been taken, and people didn't know what to do with it. They were, the authorities were going to destroy it. So the senior monk said, well, look, don't, don't kill it. Give it to us. We'll look after it. And they, so they started very small, but then they got a reputation for having a tiger. <laughs> and so someone else had a tiger, and they had another one, and they soon had a whole monastery full of tigers. <laughs> and so they, it's developed into this huge, like, zoo monastery. <laughs> Do they feel secure? <laughs> yeah. Do the tigers feel secure? No. <laughs> <laughs> the monastery. Oh, the <laughs> So then, now, Buddhism is at a very interesting junction in history. Uh, for the first time in maybe 2,500 you know, years, it's, it's just going all over the globe. 
And it used to be that teachings, you know, say from India to China, from China to Korea, Japan, would, would happen very gradually over a period of hundreds of years. But now everything's just changing at lightning speed. And uh, so one of the positions that we find ourselves in, those of us who grew up in a Western culture, uh, we train in traditional Asian ways, and then we realize that you know there's all this interest in meditation practice, uh, Buddhist practice uh, in our own countries, whether that's you know, uh, North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. And so then we, we tend to find ourselves in teaching roles, even though we may have initially gone forth into the monasteries with a bit of a hermetic bent, uh, just through the training and the experience, and just through the, the, the necessity of people interested in meditation, then uh, we tend to find ourselves more and more in teaching rules. So Buddhism coming to the West is a whole new subject that's been happening over the last 30 years. Okay. So when I first left Thailand, I went to Prague and I spent uh, six months in the countryside in Czech Republic. I lived in this little hut. This was the first meditation retreat I ever taught. And then, <laughs> there was a lot of interest in Portland. Uh, and so I was invited uh, to stay there, stay in a tent, set up a shrine. And this was a talk I gave on the 4th of July. You can see I'm very very patriotic. <laughs> I can never be accused of being unpatriotic. And then five years ago, I was invited to start a monastery in New Zealand, which was a big step. So initially, I said no. <laughs> because I know once you undertake that type of responsibility, then you have to be willing to give up a lot of meditation time to do more active things. I mean, you, we've got 100 acres. We've got building projects. We've got a big community to look after. Uh, there's a lot of administration, project management, planting trees. But New Zealand seemed to be a good place to do it. If I was going to do it anywhere, <laughs> it seems like a good place. So. <laughs> No, this wasn't my second meditation retreat. <laughs> <laughs> and we opened up a monastery called Vimuti, Buddhist monastery. Vimuti means liberation or freedom. So we have 100 acres of land. Who invited you to open this? Okay. There was... Uh, a group in Auckland that had been going for about 15 years already. They had always wanted to have a monastery. Uh, they had already purchased a piece of property just with the hope that someone might come. If you've ever seen that movie, if you build it, then... <laughs> uh, and so they were operating under that premise. And um, they had invited other people before me, but no one really wanted to take it on for various reasons. And I happened to be at the stage where um, you know, I'd been a monk for 15 years by then, and I didn't have any other commitments that would stop me from doing it, and they seemed like a very sincere group. So I said yes. So we have a good excuse to come to New Zealand now. <laughs> Everything we, we do is for free. Accommodation is for free. Possums are for free. <laughs> sheep, oh, that's the name of sheep. It's not for free. So we started with this one building and then it gradually expanded from there. So Jim, do you all come for 
from the park. Do you go out and do the alms seeking in New Zealand as well? Are the villagers used to that culture of giving food to, to the monks in the monastery? Or? Well, we live in the countryside. It's mostly farms around. And we have a very good relationship with our neighbors now. Um, but I didn't want to start off just by doing anything too weird. <laughs> because, you know, I wanted to stay in good relations. And also, um, every day, people drive out and bring food from Auckland. Mm -hmm. we, we never have to do any cooking in the monster. I mean, maybe once or twice a year, um, it doesn't work out. We have to cook something. But uh, people just love coming and bringing food. Uh, doing the alms round, it, we do do that. Um, for example, when we're just traveling, doing this tudong that uh, Roger was talking about, where we really relied on that food. When we do these walks, we don't have any money. As monks, we give up all money, all control of money. We can't even accept donations of money. So when we go off walking, we're just living day by day. We've just got a bowl and we show up at a little town, walk down the main street, stop in front of the supermarket and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> now, fortunately, that's where the rope really comes in. <laughs> it may not work for interest anybody, but it's really helpful if you have a rope on. Uh, but amazing, you know, people who are, they're not Buddhist. Uh, they may not even know exactly what we're doing. We show up out of the blue and just stand there quietly, not, not speaking to people, not, not asking for anything, definitely not asking for anything, we never ask for anything, we just stand there silently. Uh, if someone comes up and says, what are you doing, then we can explain. But, I don't know, it's like an archetype in people's minds that they somehow relate to. And it's just like some random Tuesday morning and they're going to the supermarket and they see these two Buddhist monks standing out front and you wouldn't believe it, within a half an hour, 45 minutes, we've got a full bowl. Mm -hmm. How do you obtain non-food materials? Non-food materials? Well, everything is done by donation. And so we give everything for free and we rely entirely on donations. But they can't be monitored. Well, the, the, as, as we, we're not allowed to have personal funds. The monastery itself, as an institution, can accept donations. And so we, we have a, a board, uh, a committee, which looks after that. So we have a treasurer who looks after the monastery accounts. So if we have a building project, then people want to donate for it and go into the monastery building account. And um, I, I have a bit of say over how that's used, but technically it doesn't belong to me. Uh, it belongs to the original donor. Okay, I better keep moving. This was the first hut we built, and this is where I lived for the first three years. It's just a glorified garden shed. And we built a big walking meditation path out front. Uh, I was never into building before, however, I have learned. It's amazing what you learn. Life of a monk. <laughs> Everyone gives a hand. <laughs> this is the shrine. This was a the my second hop which has just been finished recently. And we put in four ponds, getting in there with the big equipment. Looking islands. It's a meditation hut. Got lotuses planted. We've planted over 5,000 trees, getting close to 6,000 trees now. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people will plant trees in memory of someone who's passed away. <laughs> Memorial trees. This is the casting of a large bronze Buddha image for a new <coughs> shrine. This is a major ceremony that happened in Thailand. We have about a thousand people come. 
That's the head monk of our tradition, uh, the first non-Thai Western monk in our tradition. This is the arrival of the Buddha image in New Zealand. It was exceedingly heavy, <laughs> but with about eight of us, we were able to lift it up on this little shrine. And regularly teach meditation retreats in New Zealand. In December, we held a international conference on Buddhism. I uh, held in Auckland, and so that we invited people from all over the world, uh, which was a wonderful event. And here's the Tudong that we mentioned earlier. Again, living very simply, it's the mosquito net. There's no good sound. So if this doesn't entice you to go to New Zealand, I don't know what to do. It was just too hot. <laughs> Minnesota. 
So uh, last year I taught a retreat uh, in northern Minnesota at a lake cabin on the edge of Chippewa National Forest. We'll be doing it again uh, in about a week's time. Who's the other monk? Uh, his name is Venerable Jody Paolo. Uh, after this retreat, he decided to come join me in New Zealand. So he's looking after the monastery in New Zealand while I'm here. Mm -hmm. Are there any um, interest in Albert people in Buddhism? You rarely see them coming to the monastery. However, when we go walking around, uh, they're interested, kind of in a funky way. They, they tend to be have that distant, distant Franchised feeling about their community, and uh, but when they see us, they know we're not part of the mainstream white society, which is repressing them or, or how they perceive it. So they do have a kind of natural inclination to, to kind of come up and say, oh, "Dude, what you be, dude?" <laughs> uh, or just more of like, "Hey, Mike, how's it going? Mike, what you doing with the rope, Mike, Mike?" <laughs> and, and so that kind of gives, gives, uh, you know, opens the door. But they tend to be, uh, I've never had a negative encounter with a Maori. You know, it is, I really enjoy it. Very different than, than the, the European audience uh, or the Kiwis. Oh, there we go. That's the end. Thank you. 
wow, well, I wasn't going to show you any pictures of my kids. <laughs> Citizen of any particular country? I'm still a U.S. citizen, but just got permanent residency in New Zealand, which means I apply for you know, health care. <laughs> <laughs> Is your book available in the bookstore? We used to have that book in the Carlton bookstore, um, but probably not anymore. Okay. You, you, can, you can talk to me later, there's probably a few. How do you deal with technology from the slideshow? Do you have a computer at the box? <laughs> well, this is my first and only PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole it's a very interesting area because we you know we live lives growing up in caves as monks. Um, but then suddenly you know we were thrown into a very technologically advanced society. So People have different standards. Some people find them very, very useful. Uh, some people tend not to not to have them at all in the long series. Um, I use email a lot because you know, it's, it saves money, and uh, these days that's just a practical way of, of getting things done if you're an administrator. So uh, I tend to try to minimize it and uh, try not to have too much of it.